Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by MailChimp. Manage lists with up to 2,000 subscribers and send up to 12,000 emails per month for free with MailChimp. And by The Resumator. Try The Resumator, the hiring solution used by today's fastest growing startups. Start a free trial at theresumator.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups. I am your host, Jason Calacanis. Today, it is our News Roundtable edition. Thomas Corte is with us from AngelPad, and Luke Beatty is with us, formerly of Associated Contents. Content, which he sold to Yahoo for a gazillion dollars, and now running Techstars in one of the cities. I'm not sure which. We'll get to that. And plenty of news to be read by Karen Callia, the executive editor of Launch. Stick with us. It's going to be an amazing program. It's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups, our News Roundtable edition. This is the episode uh, where we talk about what's going on in tech, what's going on with startups in tech, what's going on with angel investing, venture capitalist, and we have a bunch of great guests on the program who we just wrap out about the top 10 news stories. It's a very simple thing. You can find the show anytime on YouTube, youtube.com slash thisweekin. Pretty easy to remember. Or you can go to Stitcher, and you can type in startups and will be the number one result. You can go into iTunes, podcasting, type in This Week in Startups. You get us there. You can go to TuneIn Radio and probably find us there. It's all over the place. And if you forget, go to thisweekend.com or go to Twitter and follow the handle at TWI, This Weekend, startups. Or you can follow me at Jason. Um, we've been doing the show for 352 episodes. So this is our 352nd. And with me today is Kieran Callia. Welcome back to the program to read the news. Thank you very much, sir. Luke Beatty is with us, uh, Managing Director at Techstars. You're in Boulder, is that right, Luke? So, yeah, I'm sorry, we, you cut out for a second there. You are in Boulder, yeah? I'm in Boulder, yeah. Wow, it's quite a lifestyle there, isn't it? It, it is quite a lifestyle. God, people love that boulder. It's like everybody's in great shape. Everybody's good looking. Everybody's got two or three different graduate degrees. It's pretty great. Sunny. Awesome. Um, oh, you lost my computer? I'll uh, unplug it in on it. Yeah, it's sunny and perfect. And then you get the snow and everything. Uh, and also Thomas Corte of AngelPad is with us. Hey, Thomas, how you doing? Good, good. Here's San Francisco, sunny, multi-degrees. Look at that. What a beautiful shot you have there of the, the angel pad humming and uh, amazing. And is there a, you take a dozen startups per class, correct? Dozen startups, yeah. We're actually just uh, about a week out uh, before demo day, so it, it really comes down to the wire right now. These guys are all working pretty hard. And, yeah, look uh, at the people good. panicking back there. They're in full-on, holy shit, <laughs> we got it. Oh, I cursed already. <laughs> holy sugar, they got to get their stuff together. We're going to hear about all the great stuff going on there um, as we get to the news. A couple of quick um, points of order. On June 26th and 27th, is my computer working uh, now, Brandis? You still don't have it. Okay, let me uh, unplug and plug back in one more time. Boom. Try now. Let's see if it comes back up. Uh, on the 26th and the 27th is the Launch Education and Kids Conference. It's the second time we're doing this. It's at Microsoft. Thank you so much to my friends at Microsoft for letting us use their space in Mountain View. Microsoft is a great company. They're great supporters of uh, entrepreneurship and founders and just wonderful people over there. And they've been so good to me in my entrepreneurial career. Um, I got to interview Steve Ballmer actually one time back in the day for Silicon Valley Reporter. That was a that was a, that was a we'll real treat. Back. Yeah, and they said he's going to do a keynote at one of our events, so I can't wait for that. And um, the event will be fantastic. We've got two great fireside, fireside chats now. T yeah. Tell everybody. Mitch Kapoor, who is famous for Lotus 1, 2, 3. Among and many among things. Among many things. Yeah. And uh, he is a very active investor in EdTech. And yeah. he's also involved with his wife's uh, organization, Level Playing Field Institute. Yeah. And they sponsor uh, underprivileged kids uh, who want to go into science and tech. Yeah, so Mitch is a great guy, um, and he's a legend in tech, and so it's going to be a real treat for me to interview him finally um, at Microsoft's campus. And uh, our Daphne, second fireside is... Daphne Kohler of Coursera. Awesome. And Coursera is 
like Udacity, like edX, one of the mul- massive online course. What do they call the MOOCs. MOOCs. They, they call them MOOCs. Massive online open courses. Open courses. MOOCs. M O O C, as opposed to a MOOC in a Scorsese film, which would mean an idiot. <laughs> so you can, if you're a MOOC, you can take a MOOC. All right. A MOOC. A MOOC. Or a MOOC, actually, in Japanese culture, is a magazine book as well. So there's a, a number of terms for that. Uh, but that's a pretty great lineup right there. Yeah, yep. And then we'll have 20 companies on stage presenting new products or their service and the lessons they've learned. Yep. And uh, I have a little bit of an announcement here. I'm going to uh, the launch fund is going to invest in one of the companies. All right. So we'll make a little announcement of that. Um, and I'll figure out what the dollar amount is. But I think 50 k Now that i got a $600,000 wow. a year fund, man, a splashy cashy time. Splashy cashy. And we're going to announce the first two investments of the launch fund uh, in the next month or so. Hey, judges include Esther Dyson, Adair Ressi from the Founders Institute. Uh, it's going to be really great. And uh, it's about to sell out. So if you want to buy a ticket, go ahead and go to launchedu.co and you can buy a ticket. And we do give some, uh, a lot of educators and um, startups free tickets. Yes, scholarships, we call them. We don't want to cheapen the event. But we do give scholarships to people who are... Um, you know, starting out in their careers or who are educators and teachers. Thank you to our friends at Pearson for underwriting the event as well as School Messenger. So great to have support. All right. Uh, And hey, thank you. Speaking of uh, support, the Resumator is a great product that Kieran and I use to recruit people for all the different companies we work on here. It's um, easy to use, and you can market your openings on free job boards and websites and social media, screen resumes based on job criteria, track applicants, hire employees efficiently, and stay competitive by reducing the time and cost for each hire. Customers who use the Resumator include Instagram, Pinterest, and Hootsuite never lack for a Never let a lack of hiring experience stand in the way of your company's growth. Go ahead and get a free trial by visiting theresumator.com slash twist. Theresumator.com slash twist. 14-day free trial. 15% off your first month just because you're a twist listener. And I've been using this product for six years and five, six years and love it. And I have 18,000 applicants in there, which is just incredibly powerful because I can go in there and say like, anybody who ever applied to a video editor position, anybody who ever applied to a writing position, and there might be thousands of them. And then I can say, hey, who were the highest rated? And then go check in, check their LinkedIn. Or if we post a new um, job posting on Craigslist, instead of all that existing in some Gmail account and being like all different size attachments that contain viruses, it all normalizes that. And we do great things like ask people four or five questions in order to apply for the position, which gets rid of all the drive-by and, you know, um, drive-by resume hitters and also all those uh, annoying recruiters. So we make them answer like five questions. Why do you want the job as the executive producer of This Week in Startups? What are your favorite radio shows? What's an example of something you would do to improve the show? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And we ask these questions and then we get really well thought answers from people. And we're like, that's the person to focus on. And then we bring them in, we do phoners, and in the system you can say this person is a top flight candidate, a medium, or not applicable, and it just makes the whole workflow work easy, and it costs pennies a day, maybe dollars a day. It's incredible. It's a great product, and you know what? The show is sold out for six months at a clip. We have our choice of advertisers, whitelisted advertising only on this program. Yes, whitelisted advertising. That means I will never, ever tell you about a product that I don't use myself and don't personally endorse. That's how good my life is. All right, listen. Let's get to the program. Um, what should we start with here? How about we start with Andrew Mason, just for a little bit of a change of pace, because I love Andrew, and I, I'm hearing like a thousand different things about him. All right. Well, so uh, you did have Andrew on the program about three years ago, and we oh, do yeah. have a clip of that that right, we can show. Just give Brandis a second. Oh, yeah. Hey, Brandis, let's play this clip. We had him back in May of 2010, right. um, and that was, that'd be three years ago. Three years ago, exactly, Wow. Actually. Wow. Well, Always we put the number. The ep- wow. Three years ago, he was it on was the program. Episode 52. Yeah, episode business. 52. Uh, apparently, you're still CEO. Uh, are you going to look for a new CEO? Is there pressure on you from your investors to, to get out of that seat and become the chief creative officer or something nonsensical like that? Um, no, there hasn't been. Uh, from my perspective, I don't care what I do. Uh, I just like um, being useful and doing things that are interesting and challenging. Um, but. But so far, our board seems to not want to fire me. Um, and you might, or at least they tell me that they don't. <laughs> wow, that was a pretty pressing <laughs> clip. Huh? Three years later, he got fired and uh, wrote yeah. that great thing. Okay, well, so what's going on in his world, Karen? All right, so he blogged this week that he's going to move to San Francisco this summer with his wife. Oh, great. And he's going to be a part-time partner at YC. Wow. He's going to be advising 
the companies there. Fantastic. And interestingly, he's also going to be doing an album about business knowledge. He's recorded an album in LA, he said, and it should be coming out on iTunes soon. Yes, and I have an so, announcement yes. to make. I haven't been able to talk about this, okay? But I actually am featured on one of the songs, and oh, I give no. a, oh my God. And I give a <laughs> slight rap performance. So I'm oh, rapping no. on one of the. Tra- I kid you not. I haven't been able to talk about Are it. Are you but dancing I, in the video, Jason? I, you have seen it. Oh, there, there's this video no, from the studio. Are you dancing in the video? Oh, it's going to be great. You're dancing in the video with me. <laughs> uh, yes, I, we're rapping about. Um, I, I do a little rap in one of the songs. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. Um, I guess that means you think the album is going to be horrible, <laughs> terrible, <laughs> piece of garbage. No, uh, it's there's a, there's a 95% chance this isn't true. But uh, what, what, what do you what do you think, Thomas? Uh, good move for Andrew Mason. Good move for Y Combinator. Uh, going to music. <laughs> no, let's talk about the music. No. <laughs> Moving think, to San Francisco. You know, to Wycombe, yeah. Moving to San Francisco, good move. I mean, Chicago is cold, you know, and you have what four months of nice weather. So I think that definitely is a good move. I think you know his personality probably matches Silicon Valley slightly better than than Chicago. He can do some really crazy things, and I'm kind of excited to see what his next startup is because you know he is a crazy guy. He's a wealthy crazy guy, and if you get wealth and crazy together, you usually come up with some interesting stuff. So so I'm excited to see what he's going to next. Yeah, wealth plus crazy equals angel pad, right? You start an accelerator. What do you, <laughs> Luke, you're a tremendously successful guy who sold this company and then was fired by a big major corporation, Yahoo. You didn't get fired, but I'm joking. Did, did I get fired? No, I'm joking. Um, oh, my gosh. I no. was wondering what happened. <laughs> no, you fired yourself. Um, actually, far, being fired from Yahoo would have been pretty cool, actually. But, I mean, you went into yeah. uh, an accelerator. So what, what's the appeal for entrepreneurs of, you know, selling your company or leaving your company, making a bunch of money and then like going into an accelerator. Why did you do it? What, how do you think Andrew Mason will do? Uh, well, I mean, we're, we're constantly, I mean, I did an EIR uh, at Techstars last summer before I took the managing director job. And, um, you know, it's just a good way to sort of um, re-engage with the startup community, to be involved in things that are active, to look at, you know, uh, the premium sort of deal flow that comes through places like YC and AngelPad and Techstars and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, there's kind of a common sometimes thought that people join them because they're hoping to get a CEO job with one of the companies. That's usually not uh, what I see. Um, but I think it's a good way to get your toe back in without over committing to anything. And, um, and you know, the entrepreneurs and the accelerators, um, you know, they want to work with people who've already done it. Um, and so it's, it's usually a, a pretty good mix and it's a flexible kind of role. You know, I mean, he could probably be there for, um, a, a one cohort or two cohorts, cohorts or, or extend it. And what do you think will happen with you there? I mean, you think you're, you're in it as a managing director for the long haul, right? I mean, this is going to be your career for the next five, 10 years at least. Yeah, I mean, that's the plan, um, you know, continue to, you know, work not only on, on my portfolio, but also the, the evolution of, of Techstars as we launch accelerators and places like embedded within companies like Nike and then, you know, um, you know, some international stuff that we have going on now. So, yeah, it's great. It's exciting. And, um, and, and it's, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the energy around this stuff is, is, is good for me. Um, well, we wish him all the best, and let's book him for uh, the show as right. quick as possible. Actually, let's do a live. Let's do. I want to do a live show. Okay. You guys can get your guitars and stuff out, and really yes. maybe do a, turn it into a music. Absolutely, show. this is a great idea. <laughs> Tell him we want to have do a live show with him and debut the album on the live show and do a live performance. Oh. And we'll do a live performance of my track. So when is the album supposed to come out? I don't know when it drops. I don't know okay. when it drops. I know. I know. I got a. You have so many albums coming. I know. I got. I got. I got a lot. Well, you know, here's the thing. I'm sort of like Diddy, in that I just pop into an Alicia <laughs> Keys here. You know, I'll pop into yeah. you know another uh, Beyonce song here. I just pop in and I get a third of the royalties for the track. So that's the way I make my money. Uh, just drop it in on tracks. I want that gig. It's pretty. Yeah. It's like it's no no different than running an accelerator. Uh, you just get a slice and yeah, you move on to the next thing. All right. Next story. Let's do uh, Blackberry. All right, so BlackBerry World in Orlando this week. You were actually there. I was there. For some of the excitement, and we know you love your new Q10. Loving um, it. So interestingly, BlackBerry Messenger is going to be coming to Android and iOS. Yeah. And as we know, BlackBerry has uh, still a fairly large number of users, um, 60 million um, monthly active, 51 million using uh, the app for about 90 minutes a day. 
So how much is this going to affect iOS and Android users? Well, I can tell you, number one, the BlackBerry Q10 is an amazing device. The OS has caught up to, on an operating system basis, they caught up to, uh, certainly caught up to iOS. And they've definitely exceeded Android, which isn't saying much because Android is pretty sloppy. They, what they haven't succeeded in doing is obviously yet having the cohort of apps. So, like, I don't have Evernote yet on my BlackBerry, but I know that Phil is working on that. I was going to say, Phil wants to be everywhere. Right. And so I, and I know for a fact he's working on it because I asked him and he told me he was. You know, that's probably confidential. But the fact is, it w Evernote will be coming out for BlackBerry. And so for me then, I've had this amazing experience of late where I can, because of Evernote, Twitter, and Gmail, go into any device, and within maybe 10 minutes of the device, I can learn the device and log in and synchronize all my accounts. And it's like I'm on my desktop or whatever other computer. So the cloud has changed the idea of like portability of, of services. So, but this specifically moving BlackBerry Messenger, which was Message Me before it existed, and having it work on other platforms is something they should have done three or four years ago. But it definitely shows that they've changed, the, they're, they've been humbled frankly. Very. Yeah. But their stock has gone up two and a half times since everybody thought they were going to die. They're not going to die. And they, the bigger thing was they released a Q5 phone, which is a world phone, which will probably be 100 or 200 bucks. So a $200 smartphone that works around the world for emerging markets with a keypad, it's going to be a huge hit. What do, you, what do you guys think? You guys think BlackBerry is out of it? Or you think this is uh, signs that they, they might make a run at it again? I, I'm pretty excited about what they've built. Um, you know, I think, you know, my first obviously smartphone in a way with a keyboard was a BlackBerry back 2003, 2004. Or so, and I have to say, I haven't touched one since then. You know, when I when I switched over, but. You know, when you look at, you know, you know, Apple has a great, great ecosystem. Apple has, you know, the, the apps, everything there, the design. You know, Google kind of can capture a lot with Android, especially when you look at the, the, the longer tail and just, you know, making this a lot more inexpensive. No one really has truly captured the enterprise. And I think, you know, with, with, Black, uh, with uh, BlackBerry coming back, there's a good chance that a lot of purchasing managers are going to try to get out of iOS or not even get into it and stick with BlackBerry. So... Security, you know, enterprise, all those features, BlackBerry is still top, I think. Yeah, see, that's what people don't realize. When I was down there, and I told Sean Gold, because I was down there doing some business development. I can't talk about exactly what. But I wasn't just there as a journalist. I probably would not have gone, actually, as a journalist. I was there for high-level meetings. Um, it's kind of obnoxious to say. Just, I was just there for meetings. Like, yeah, High-level so meetings. Obnoxious. Like, well, who am I, the president? Yeah, I was just there for a meeting. I was there for a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a couple of side meetings, but I was there for a meeting. All right, I'm ch listen, I'm out there trying to make things happen. No poker game. No poker game. Anyway, the point is, um, th I told Sean, bring a suit, and I brought a suit. And I'm not talking a suit jacket with jeans like I'm wearing now. I said, you know, pants. Bring pants. <laughs> bring pants. Pants not optional. <laughs> so we bring suits, and sure enough, you start walking around Black Bear World, suits, and ties. This is the IT crowd, and on a global basis, the IT crowd. So I like I, the first guy I meet is from Saudi Arabia. He's like, yeah, I run the biggest IT company in Saudi Arabia, and every, everybody's got a BlackBerry, and everybody w can't wait for this BlackBerry. It's like people don't understand that. If you're doing business, like, and in some of those countries, they've banned Blackberries because they're so goddamn secure and encrypted and everything that the, these other governments can't... Um, can't break in. They can't break in. So anyway... The other thing is, have you noticed, Luke, that since the iPhone was introduced and the Blackberries, um, the Blackberries have sort of, uh, they started crashing and they just basically had the old OS, that everybody's writing like short emails, like, I'll get back to you later, Buttercup, and you're like, what? And it's like auto spelling errors. What do you think, Luke? Yeah, I, I think that that's like that's exactly what BlackBerry has in its in its in its potential pocket is just you know crushing the the enterprise market and, and understanding the world of enterprise messaging, enterprise chat, enterprise um, communications, making it server side, secure, searchable, all that sort of stuff. So I think the more they sort of play on the um, the uh, the fact that they could that that they're building stuff for businesses, and then obviously that's a whole different pricing structure and and. and, and uh, model, but um, that's their only way to go. Yeah, I think they'll win back the enterprise, and they're going to win back the CEO class, the, you know, the, the top 
you know, 20% of companies that actually need to write long emails when on the road. I used to write my emails. Yes, you did. I would write a full thousand word email and email it to you. Or I'd have it set up on the plane. I would sit there on the plane and write it. It was like very comfortable for me. Um, but actually, you know, who made an interesting comment it was um, Renee Ritchie uh, of iMore. And she pointed out every Apple mobile competitor now makes apps for iOS and for cross-platform. Well, Apple makes nothing for nothing Android, for Windows, nobody. and BlackBerry. That's correct. And this is, and it's a, it's an astute point, and I've brought it up before on the program, what is Apple doing that they are think that they can just avoid this trend of like, oh yeah, people are gonna start using our web services, but our web services are not gonna work on other platforms. Like, why does iMessage not work on Android? Why does iPhoto, not available on Android or other places. Why so, don't they want to infect? Why don't they want to infect the other people? I mean, what do you guys think about this, Thomas? Is 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 Apple making a huge blunder by not being cross-platform with their apps? I really do wonder about this, especially now that I see how well Google builds applications for iOS. You know, it's been a big change inside Google in you know, the past you know year and a half, two years, to build great applications for iOS. And look, I'm I'm using the Google navigation. I don't use the uh, the Apple native navigation when I use it. So. I think I wonder if if Apple doesn't make the same mistake it has done before, you know, being a completely closed environment. Um, it's it's always very beneficial to start out with, you know, they have the infrastructure and the, the ecosystem to do it. Um, can they do it? You know, I mean, Android today is already much bigger. BlackBerry is the, like it's. I would really consider doing some of the core functionality, like you know, the uh, was it uh, message me or the um, uh, the video thing? What's it called? Forgot the name. Uh, uh, Oh, FaceTime. FaceTime. Yeah, like, why is FaceTime yeah. not on Android? It's FaceTime. Stupid. At least FaceTime. At, l at, at least FaceTime. It's so stupid. It's like Apple is so, for, for a company that makes such brilliant products, they can be so stupid. iMessage and FaceTime are designed, and the value of those things increase with the size of the network. Exactly. Pure network effect. What do you think, Luke? Is this somewhere where like a Yahoo can start infecting across ecosystems? Because they have the beautiful weather app that they make. Yahoo now makes a beautiful weather app for iOS. Do you think this is it's somewhere great, where... great, right? Yeah. That app's great. You think this is uh, going to be like I a trend? I don't know. I, I, do, I agree with you guys. I don't, I don't, I don't understand at all that um, closed, closed network stuff. And, um, you know, I think it's... Uh, I, I think it's an understated risk to what you guys are saying. Like, I think it's a huge risk and a and a and a and, a, and one that you know I, I don't know that it won't pay off, but I I don't think that it's um, I don't think that it'll um, go without um, having massive repercussions for them. And it may work out, you know, in a in a massive way, but it's I think it's very risky. Let's talk Yahoo Tumblr. All right, so Yahoo yes. reportedly Yahoo reportedly yeah. talking to Tumblr. Who was the first to report that? Do you know? All Things D. All Things D. Okay, so Kara gets it right again. So Kara Swisher, who's also going to be doing our live show. She is, June 7th June in San 7th. Francisco. Oh, yeah. And so Kara reported that Marissa and some other executive, Marissa has talked to, to David Karp and some other Tumblr mm -hmm. executives, mm -hmm. and there's course interest perhaps from Facebook as well we're hearing now. Yep. So what does this mean for Yahoo if it can actually get Tumblr? Well, let's talk to Luke since he, he was inside. He sold yeah. his company to Yahoo. What do you think? Um, I think it's great. I think it's great for both. Um, Why? I think that uh, Why is well, it great? I think I think it's great because Yahoo, one of the things that Yahoo does very well is um, because of it, its entire, uh, not entire, almost its entire business runs off the conversion of people off of uh, its homepage. And, uh, you know, they run, as, as they often talk about, um, custom homepages, obviously, for every single user, and they're constantly moving those things through. Um, and they do have the ability to surface, if they, if they implement the same technology across the um, Twitter, uh, the Twitter data set in its broadest sense and deliver people um, Twitter feeds that, that they know, uh, that they want, and ones maybe that they don't want. I think Twitter, on the other hand, Twitter also uh, discovery is, I'm sorry, Tumblr, Tumblr. Um, it's a, it, it, delivering the right, you know, Tumblr content of which there's, you know, billions of, of assets being pushed through there. I think it's, they have the ability to surface those to people. And one of the problems with Tumblr is obviously, um, um, surfacing related content to people and, and, and Yahoo does have that technology and that is a massive collection of, of content and a massive uh, database of, of, of relevant um, is there a risk frag though fragmented information is there a risk that sending and driving Yahoo traffic into Tumblr 
means you're going to send the mothers and fathers of 15-year-old girls uh, who are in love with Tumblr into that system where they're hiding from their parents. What do you think, Thomas? Oh, well, don't they do that already? Um, <laughs> well, like, as a parent, I think the 15-year-olds is too late to talk about. Yeah. I think uh, when I when I look at Twitter as a whole and kind of these rumors about Tumblr, you know, we don't know if they're true. We know that the Twitter thing is true. You know, we know the acquisitions that are making are true. Um, I, you know, I, I think Yahoo. I mentioned it when we were, um, you know, when we were live uh, talking together a couple weeks ago. You know, Yahoo was back on top with Marissa at the helm. Um, they bought a company from us, Astrid, um, to really work on iOS and kind of do lists and things like that. Um, I look at the Twitter stuff. You know, I just look at how I use Twitter and I look at. LinkedIn, for example. You know, when LinkedIn uh, got yanked out uh, the Twitter feed, um, you know, it took them a while to figure out how to replace that. But today, I look at, at LinkedIn, and I, I get pretty darn, darn good news feeds uh, from people sharing inside LinkedIn. So I, I feel both, um, you know, we know the Twitter thing is going to happen. If the Tumblr thing is going to happen, you know, Yahoo has a long history of real content, um, probably more so than any other Silicon Valley company. You know, they had at groups, uh, you know, didn't they buy back then uh, um, you know, a bunch of uh, kind of website builders back in 2000? Yeah, they did. Well, I mean, obviously they had GeoCities famously, but they did have some of those GeoCities. other... GeoCities, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my feeling on this is, um, and hey, um, Brandis, just ask Thomas to turn off the YouTube stream or any other apps he's got because he's, he's going in and out, fading in and out. Um, my feeling on this is, yeah, it's great for Yahoo. Tumblr... I'm not so sure Yahoo's a great home for them. I think it's an okay place. I mean, it's it a great. It doesn't seem like a fit. Well, here's culturally. the thing. They could. Tumblr is just starting monetization, so obviously monetization Yahoo can help with. I don't think Yahoo can help with, like any kind of cool factor or anything like that. But um, they do have a huge ad sales force, and they can start selling into it. All that kind of great stuff. Um, what I do think is going to happen in this position is, I think Marissa is going to get outbid. Again, right? Because she lost Yelp and she lost other deals. Um, although maybe this time she'll hold her ground and just not blink. But well, she's I, CEO this time. That's true too. It's uh, a fair point. I think that Zuckerberg is going to come out and he's going to throw his weight around. He's going to throw his paycheck. Or you know, the fact that he can he has authority to do whatever he wants. He's got a lot more money in the bank. Well, the way Sean Parker set it up, you know, basically. Zuck can do whatever he wants. And the, and the Instagram purchase was a perfect example of that. He just said, I'll double whatever Twitter's giving, so here's your billion dollars, let's go. And I will never interfere with what you're doing, go. Or, you know, not for some time. And now that he's got Kevin uh, Sistrom, who's been on the program from Instagram, he's got the ability to take Kevin and use him as a example of, hey, I buy stuff, I don't F with it. And I don't, I don't think Yahoo can say that historically, and neither can Google. No, Google's ask, known for killing stuff. Ask the so delicious what folks. I think Zuckerberg is doing is brilliant. He's setting himself up as the friendly entrepreneur buyer to let you do whatever you want, and he's got an unlimited amount of uh, you know, stock and cash that he can pull the trigger on. He's got such a huge advantage. And if he comes in and says, hey, I'll give you two, that's just going to totally make him the top M&A guy in the business, hands down. Am I right or am I wrong, Luke? Uh, you know, I, I would say as it stands today, I think you're right. Uh, I, I would say that it's not beyond the realm of possibility that that Marissa could acquire a company like Tumblr and and leave it as a standalone business. Um, you know, I, we know that's not, and I know from my own personal experience, that that's not the, the, the way they've done it in the past. Um, but I would, you know, if, if past... If precedent is, is is the right predictor, then you're you're probably right. I, I don't know that there can be a um, a kingmaker in the valley for uh, acquiring businesses um, just because of the diversity of them. Um, but maybe if you're talking about you know the big consumer facing um, uh, applications, then maybe you're right. All right. When we get back from the commercial break, we're going to talk about Tesla uh, doing a. Uh, Tesla stock just exploding. We're going to talk about Yahoo's partnership with uh, Twitter, another partnership for them. Um, Larry Page and uh, Google I.O., uh, Department of Homeland Security, has halted the Bitcoin transactions at Mt. Gox and seized their funds. There's a lot going on in the space. Um, and oh, Twitter made an acquisition. And Scoble um, had Tactus, which is a very super interesting, cool uh, technology. All that and more when we come back from the commercial break. All right. Uh, 
What, who's, who is the commercial? The Resonator I did. That Real was chain. great. Real chain. Oh, God, it's not even a commercial. <laughs> MailChimp. We're done. Thank you. Uh, listen, what do I got to tell you about MailChimp? Number one, it's easy to use. Number two, it's affordable. Number three, the free plan is always free. 2,000 subscribers, 10,000 emails a month, something like that. The greatest software, the best design, multi-level accounts, email templates, mobile, responsive web design, all that kind of nice stuff. Incredible metrics. Easy unsubscribe. You can put your emails through a spam filter checker to make sure that you don't put keywords in it that would wind up in spam. Incredible customer service. And why am I just looking into the camera telling you all this stuff without having to look at the copy? Because I've been using this goddamn product for four, five, six years. And I love it. And I'm so pleased that MailChimp has been sponsoring my program since day one. They are, hands down, along with GoToMeeting, the longest running partner I have. Microsoft too, I guess, you know, for the event. But anyway, point is, MailChimp is absolutely fabulous and easy to use. And if you have a business, social networks change. So you invested all this money in getting likes for your Facebook page, and then Zuckerberg changed the algorithm, and now when you do an update, it doesn't end up on all those people's pages. So you said, oh, I'm going to pay a dollar, two dollars to get a follower on, or a, you know, a friend or a like on, a like on, fa on Facebook. How did it work out for you? You spent 10 grand getting 10,000 people, now you can't reach them. If you had spent 10 grand on acquiring email addresses, you'd still be able to reach them. And MailChimp's not going to try to screw with your ability to reach those people. But Zuckerberg did. He wants you to pay twice now. He wants you to pay the Zuckerberg tax. And if you invested all this money in your MySpace page or your Friendster page, that would all have gone to zero. But if at that same time you had invested in building your email list, you would have been a hero, not a zero. Stick with MailChimp. Stick with email. My email, Jason at Calacanis, will be my email for life. Once you get my relationship in your MailChimp, you have me for life. And they do A-B testing, I love that too, where you can test two different headlines, you send to a thousand people on your list, it looks at which one got the best response and then sends to the rest of the people dynamically. Incredible features like that make MailChimp the ultimate solution. Thank you so much to my friends at MailChimp. Version 8 has multi-user access, which is great, and the free plan is always free. Thank you so much. 2,000 subscribers and 12,000 emails per month for free. Everybody thank MailChimp on their Twitter account. If you don't use it, what are you waiting for? Get in there. All right, let's do, uh, what's the best story here? I got to talk about Google I.O. Yeah, let's talk about Google I.O. All right, I mean, yeah. this is their uh, big keynote uh, of the year. They yep. did last year, very famously, Google Glass, the whole demo with uh, Sergey uh, jumping, you know, out, jumping of out of the plane and landing well, did, on. Sergey jumped out of a plane. Yeah. He did, right, yeah. And, you know, Sergey, you know, on the roof of the Moscone Center, and it was very, very dramatic. Nothing quite that exciting this year, and they were yeah. trying to downplay expectations a bit. So lots of things came out. The expected music service for nine ninety nine a month. No, Sergey was on the, he was on roof, the roof of the building. Right, yeah. right. The guy came But down. he is a skydiver, so why didn't he do it? Uh, anyway, whatever. So anyway, go ahead. So they, like I said, they came out with the music service that people were expecting <clears> that had been leaked ahead of time, uh, a special Galaxy. What is the name of the music service? Do Google you know? Play Music. Google Play Music. Yeah. Okay. Why don't they just call it Google Music? Why did they throw Play in the middle of it? Because they have the Google Play Store? That's just dumb. They usually say Google Music. All right. And, of course, there are some new apps for Glass. Uh, those are some exciting things for folks who already have them, not for the rest of us. Evernote, Twitter, et cetera. And the hardware, the... So Evernote, Twitter, and Tumblr now work. Okay. Yep. And then the hardware, you had the Galaxy uh, Samsung S4 completely unlocked with the Nexus user experience. People were not happy when they heard the price, $649. For a Nexus 4? Yes. It's like a Nexus 4 type phone. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Google Plus, they came out with some, some fun stuff and voice activated commands for search. So of all these things, what were you most excited about? Nothing. Nothing. This was a huge donut. 0.0. .0. This was just evolutionary stuff, but it does show that these guys are taking over the world and they're going to put every startup out of business. I mean, it just shows how powerful they are. Because I looked down that list of features and it was like, oh yeah, we're, we're going to replace the gift standard. Oh, we're going to replace Spotify. We're going to replace this. They're going to replace everything. That right. was like a death list of startups. Thomas, when you see Google performing at this high level and you're a Google alum, does it worry you that this company is getting so big, so powerful and has such a huge footprint today? Or is there going to still be an opportunity to work with this company? 
about it. Um, I, if the company is anything like and the leadership is anything like uh, when I was there, um, you know, these are good people with good intentions. And I think, you know, kind of Larry's do good to philanthropy uh, speech kind of maybe reinforce that. But I, I think there's truly good intentions in changing the world. And, um, you know, when I, when I look down the list, look, I am not excited jumping up and down about anything. There's no major announcement where I'm like, yeah, you know, this is amazing. But what Google is so good at is, is, is really the evolutionary development. You know, when you look at Gmail, it wasn't great when it started. When you looked at, uh, you know, Google maps. Video, yeah. it's uh, Maps. I mean, name every product. And, you know, barely ever was Google really on the forefront of the first mover um, innovation. You know, it's different maybe for Glass and, and the Google Car, but, but Google is really good in making things incrementally better, you know, very, very stubbornly over time and coming out on top. And I think that's what they've shown in this, in this I.O. Oh, by the way, just a quick, quick update here. Yes, it is called Google Play Music All Access. So <laughs> even it's better. five <laughs> words. Whoever named this at Google needs to be shot. Like, why Literally. Not easy? Like, <laughs> can you, how about we call it Google Play Music All Access Unlimited Plus? Because then you'd incorporate the plus for Google Plus. Chrome. <laughs> Android. I mean, how many goddamn brands? I mean, if Steve Jobs met with Larry Page, he would smack him. Like, Jesus, like, how many things can you call one? It would, when Apple releases their music, it's going to be like, iMusic. They're going to add a character to the word music. They added four words to the word music. Google Play before it, all access after it. Nonsensical. Terrible idea, Google. Uh, but let's talk about let's talk about music real quick because I, yeah. in a way, I find that interesting. So, I my prediction is going to be it's not going to be successful. Um, but Why? that's not Why? the point. Why? You know, I, I I don't think Google has a history of really mass marketing. Um, you know, something like this. Hmm. Um, the other, the, I guess, the advantage they have that a lot of people, you know, in the middle of America, you know, don't think about Spotify like you and I do, and and kind of have the right on. So so maybe they can push it to their channels. But here's what I'm excited about, and this kind of goes into into uh, you know what you do with music and what music says about you. You know, if you if you use mu music to, to better identify your users and understand what they do, you have a really, really valuable asset. Um, and I think that's, that's why I could, Google think, uh, could see Google going to. Um, just a quick plug. We have actually one company in the current cohort that does something very similar where they, where they you know, index all the social graphs to figure out um, what you're listening to uh, and, and what your taste is. Basically, building a taste graph around your mu music. What's the uh, name of that called, company? The company is called audience.fm. And, uh, you know, it is pretty powerful, you know, when they index my stuff, I mean, they basically put, put up a picture of, like, you know, what I wear and, you know, where I likely live. And, you know, you can tell a lot about people based on their musical um, uh, taste. Um, that's a clever idea. It's almost like Pandora, but based on your social network and your likes. It's pretty brilliant. Yep. All right, well, we'll look forward to Audience.fm next week. Luke, what do you think of the um, Google, Google I.O.? Google Music, and Google Glass. Pick any of those. Uh, I think music is probably uh, the most impactful of all these. None of them blew my mind. Um, I, I wait for a Google I.O. where um, the company refocuses um, or begins to focus, I guess. I, I think they're so awesome at, at, at inventing and engineering new things. I think the... The UI, UX around all of these things is so terminally bad um, <laughs> and easily repairable that it blows my mind. So, you know, I, I, when I think about some of these things, Google Glass not being in that world, but, uh, but things like music, I, I only envision a world where it's something that, that you know, in the back end works magically and, and quickly and, uh, but is, is so wonky to work with and has save buttons and things that we all lost a long time ago so i i hope for that someday i have to say i'm getting you know i haven't worn google glass but uh nick belton wrote something in the new york times about he was at this at the io conference and of course everybody's got google glass on and he goes to the bathroom and there are people to the left and the right of him going left and right and he notices them winking Oh. To take photos. Oh. And I said, oh. And I just thought to myself, this is, this, the, the headset is really, truly loathsome. 
on so many levels. And then Scott Heiferman, I don't know if you saw the Scott oh, Heiferman. Oh, he had quite the rant, didn't he? Yeah, did you see Scott Heiferman's rant? Anybody see Scott Heiferman's rant? No, I, I did not. Oh, wait a second. I'm going to put the, is my computer working, Brandis? My computer's not working. Uh, is there a computer back there that's working? That can play the video? No? No, we don't, the we can't play a video. Oh. Computers are so 2012. You don't have no, to No, you know, we just, glass. we have something going wrong with our stupid um, TriCaster, I guess, so we can't play the video. But anyway, there's a great video where Scott Heiferman, who is the most gentle guy I know, who I met in Web 1.0 doing eye traffic, like a startup building banner ads in 96, 97. He's like, if I am talking to somebody with these glasses on and they start looking up to the left and start blinking and doing stuff, I am going to punch them in the face. And he like sticks his fist out. And he's like, listen, the computer and our laptops being with us was like, it took 30 seconds for us to get to something interesting, more interesting than the person we're talking to. He goes, then like the phone made it like 15 seconds to get to more, something more interesting than the person who's in front of you. Now glass makes it three seconds or two seconds to get something more interesting than you. Uh, and he's like, and, and I'm starting to get that. And I was like, you know, I was sort of trading back and forth with Jeff Jarvis and Nick Belton about his story. And I was like, I think Nick Belton's right. Like these things are just a little, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not a Luddite. I'm actually kind of a tech, no file. So, but this is got bad, very bad ramifications, I believe. And I think that they're kind of inappropriate and obnoxious. I don't know. What do you think, Luke? Do you, I mean, if people start, if you have a dinner party and three people show up with these and five people don't have them on, what do you do? Uh, I think it's a lot different than the first time you saw somebody with a with a smartphone. It is different, isn't it? Why? I, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, there there are a couple monsters walking around the the tech stars office in this year's cohort with them. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I think it feels kind of wrong, right? Out. I mean, the fact that they're opening uh, stores is amazing to me. Google's, yeah, going to be opening stores. And that, I guess that's going to be like a pretty big deal because everybody's going to go there. Thomas, you have a dinner party. You invite eight really good people, cool people you like. Three of them show up with Google Glass, which is a real possibility given where you live and your LinkedIn uh, network and the fact that you're a, a Google <laughs> alumni. Three people show up with those things for your great dinner party. Do you ask them to take them off or not? Yes or no? No, I. I asked the other five, why didn't you bring yours? <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, how do you, are you, you that's a great joke. Look, I, I, but I, I think, mean, I think, you know, we're just learning about this. You know, I think it's, it's all about changing social norms. You know, if, if when I, when I had my first phone, like you wouldn't take a phone call during a dinner party today, I see that all the time, people texting on the table. Um, I think last, you know, we just have to learn how, how, what the social norms are around these new technologies. I remember, you, you all remember this, you know, the, remember the X10 camera? Back, there was those pop unders uh, that had to, those tiny little yeah. cameras, right? Which was like, you know, a, like a half, half naked woman, you know, you'd be like, oh, you have a camera the size of, you know, your thumbnail you can hide everywhere. And it was like a big uproar, like, oh my God, like, you know, what yeah. does that mean, you know, for cameras? Everywhere? And nobody like, bought them. I, I have six cameras right around me right now. I have two of me looking. My computer is looking at me. My iPad is looking at me. My phone is looking at me, a front facing yeah. camera. So, I think we just have to figure out what the appropriate social setting is and the appropriate technology for this is. I think it's inevitable that we have information in our view corridor, um, be it in a glass, be it on a contact lens, or, or be it you know, in our car on the screen. Um, and it's exciting. Did you see my tweet to Nick Belton about, and Jeff Jarvis of why it's different? No, I didn't. Okay, so why are Google Glass different than a smartphone? Let me see if Kieran gets it. There are two reasons. Well, the one is that it's wearable technology, right? It's actually on your body. No, but what's no? the difference in terms of social norms? With the phone, you can tell when somebody's using it. Ah, yes. So you got one of them, yeah. which is when you're wearing glass, it's covert. The usage... Except for the winking. Well, the, yeah, but even with winking, like I'm blinking, am I blinking or winking? You know, what, which one am I doing here? You know, do I have a twitch? You know, if you have a twitch, is it taking pictures constantly? I know a couple <laughs> guys who got twitches. <laughs> I mean, it's, how does that work? And, you know, and so that's number one. It's, co it's covert. And the number two thing that's very different about it is what? That's different than the smartphone. See if you get it. It's that you don't know where all that information is going? No. No. You could just assume it's going everywhere. It's, it's, that, it, it's that it impresses, the in, it impresses upon others' involvement. Yes, it's, it's there's intrusive. No permissioning around, there's no permissioning around it. If I have my smartphone, it could be doing a lot of things. I suppose 
I could be taking a picture of you, that would be pretty overt. But there is, there's a lack of permissioning around it, which is what I think gives people the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, and I would say... But, well, but persistent- guys, what about, what about the GoPro? So I, you know, when I ski up in Squaw, you know, it seems like two out of three people have a GoPro camera on their helmet. You yeah. know, I see it now with bicyclists in San Francisco. Is that different? Well, I would say if somebody walked up to you with a GoPro and said, hey, how are you doing? And there was a red light on? Or like, nobody's, nobody, have you ever been at a party, a dinner party, and three people have GoPros on their head? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's Unlikely. different when you're interacting with people. So like, while I appreciate, yes, I, there might be somebody who zipped by me and gets, you know, but like, it's also kind of creepy. Like, what, I mean, then like, guy, are, are guys like skiing behind girls, like videotaping them? I mean, that's what 15 year old boys are going to be doing with this stuff, you know? Um, but persistence. That's the other big difference. So I tried to explain this to Jeff Jarvis, who, you know, Jeff's a smart guy, but is he, like Scoble, like Jeff Jarvis and Scoble are like two ends of a spectrum. Like Scoble's just like, oh my God, it's the greatest thing ever. You know, and then you have <laughs> Jeff Jarvis over here who's like very curmudgeonly or wants to be like scholarly. He's kind of like scholarly. So like he feels like he has to school everybody. Like Jeff Jarvis is like, I kind of feel like he's always in a cap and gown. Like when I picture Jeff Jarvis, like, it's like three in the morning and he's tweeting. He's in a cap and gown like a professor, but like what a professor would wear to like Oxford. And he's got that stick with the chalk at the end and he's like tapping on the board incessantly trying to, when he does his tweets, that's Jeff Jarvis. And I love you, Jeff, and you gotta come on the program, but still. And I tried to tell him, Jeff. And he's like, oh no, no, it's no different than smartphones. I'm like, it, it's covert, it's persistent. Like, I mean, as, if I have my smartphone like this, hey, uh, you wanna get lunch, Karen? How was your day? <laughs> hey, how's everything at home? Hey, you know, uh, it's like, what? I, I don't. I think, J- Jason, it's inevitable. I mean, I, th- I think we can, you know, you, you, we know this is where this is going, and I think it's about the social norms that we built around it, um, and, and, and maybe even the legal framework. I know you're not going to like that, but, yeah. but there's things that we need to figure out how to do this with, and I think, you know, Google Glass is the first version of this. This is like walking around in... 19, you know, 79 with a with a big brick from Motorola. Yeah, um, it was really really odd. Or seeing someone on on a, on a phone in a car, like people were like, what happened there, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I yeah, find it's called myself a car accident. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> every that's, time it's accidents. inevitable every that time, people are going to die texting. Can you imagine if I told they you they are that, dying? Exactly. If I, can you imagine, Thomas, if I told you in 1979, people are going to write sentences to each other while they're driving 65 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and th- that's how people are going to die. That's going to be the number one killer of kids. Kids are going to be dying because they're sending each other haikus at not, 65 miles an hour. Not because they went drinking with their friends. Not because they were drinking and driving. Not because they were taking LSD and jumping off bridges. No. Kids are dying because they're sending each other one-line jokes. I mean, it's pathetic. Not more. And not just kids. It's adults, too. I mean, you drive up the goddamn 405 here, and everybody is texting en masse. I mean, at least use your 17-inch, uh, you know, Tesla Model S. <laughs> Screen. Screen. Uh-huh. I read the New York Times. Much when safer. I, when I first got it, I started putting in bookmarks, and I'm, like, literally stuck in non-traffic. So I'm like, all right. So I'm on the 405. So I put New York Times in. And the, f- the first time I did it, I was like, oh, my God. I'm reading the New York Times on the 405. I am never using the web browser while driving again. And since that time, I have not. And I put my phones in my bag when I drive now. I put on an audio book. I put the that phone That's a very good bag. idea. The phone I think that's bag. actually, put it, put it away, yes. Put it out of reach, because otherwise you will reach for the, it. The screens will be tactus soon. Yes, let's say a good segue. Thank you, Luke. Look at, <laughs> look at, look, look look at, at Radio Luke. Luke. I'm, in talk show, I'm in the talk show business. Look at Radio Luke. All right. Radio Luke. So, okay. So this was You a, better use your radio voice because you're going to be the first one to respond to this, Luke. I right. want a good NPR voice okay. or uh, Rush voice. So, Robert okay. Scoble, your favorite uh, technology Hi, I'm champion. I'm Robert Scoble. I need to, you know what I need to do is I need to get Lauren Feldman in here to be Scoble okay. during the show. Okay, because um, I did ask Robert, and he's booked on Fridays for Gilmore Gang, so he I can't know. join us. So I should just have him. And like, what is Gilmore in. doing the show on the same time as I am? I mean, this is lame. But we should definitely have like a puppet corner, and we should just have <laughs> Lauren do like a, just have like the Loic puppet ready, the Mike Arrington puppet, uh, maybe not that one. No, please. In the circumstances. Um, but like, um, not to make light of anything inappropriate or appropriate or whatever anyway um god you can't even mention that situation without it being icky um scoble puppet Luik puppet which is hysterical i think you should have a sergey puppet that would be great to have a larry and sergey puppet or yeah. a tim cook puppet but i you know i 
Yeah. Okay. Anyway, we, we, I'm gonna put the puppet idea on the back burner. Tell me about this trip tease. Tactus. Tactus is just one of the companies from launch. That's correct. So the whole idea is that um, it uses microfluidics to move non-toxic polymer-based materials. Okay, so basically... Microfluidics. Speak English. So you know your phone has a flat screen on it, right? The touch screen. Yes, it's called glass. Yes, so basically little nodules almost will pop up and you'll be able to use those to navigate and to... to I I don't know what you're talking about. Play the video. Yeah. Here we go. Play the video. All right, now I know what you're talking about. I have seen this. So, yeah, here, I've seen this, yes. All right, watch this, people. So here we're seeing a, uh, they're playing like a hipster beat in the background. I feel like I'm in a lounge right now. Okay, they're typing, and that's kind of interesting. So this dude in a puppy jacket says, oh, It's wait. like your BlackBerry keyboard, but it's on a flat screen. Yeah, it's like a BlackBerry keyboard on a flat screen. So this was not developed by Apple, so this will never be on an iPhone. Well, they are expecting to have OEM showing the product at the next Consumer Electronics it, Show. You know what? Lo- I, the reason I like this is because it makes me feel like that's like those little um, popcorn things that you pop. <laughs> oh, like the bubble wrap. It's bubble wrap. Put you make your phone. your phone into bubble wrap. What do you think of that, uh, Radio Luke? Um, you know, when I, when I saw this, uh, the first thing that occurred to me is <laughs> that it could it could conceivably br- finally bring innovation to like signage and all things outdoors and things that are out in front of buildings and yeah. menus and all of these kinds of things where the format needs to change all the time. Um, you know, I, it's it, I suspect it's something that might look as it stands right now at the stage it's at. It might look cooler on video than it does in your in. Uh, with my breakfast sausages typing on it, but um, but I I, I I like it. It's it's. I mean, I obviously I see a lot of things, and it certainly seems interesting to me. But signage, kind of, um, you know, it's it's sort of like the tablet. Um, yeah, when Gates know, was promoting it. it, it. <laughs> right. It's not re- it's not ready for prime time. What do you think of this, Thomas? Sure. Is this uh, something you think is interesting? I, I think it's really interesting. I think it's really, really interesting. When I when I saw this, I, I didn't see it before you sent it to me this morning. And uh, you know, when you when you think about you know going back to uh, to glass and and to accidents and all this stuff, you know, we don't use all of our sensors. When you think about it, you know, we we use you know voice. We use uh, you know what we see. You know, our our certainly um, hearing. But you know, there's very few things that we do through uh, through sensing of the fingertips. And I, I have this in my car, so there's a lot of buttons on my steering wheel. Um, to control all kinds of stuff, and and they have different shapes, um, and I can actually use them without looking down. The same way when I when I go on my keyboard, the Apple keyboard, you know the uh, the F and what is it, the F and the uh, the J key have a little tiny bub- bubble up, so I find them right away when I'm starting to type without having to look down. That's true too. So yeah. I think I think there's a lot of applications where you know we could do something without looking at it, um, and especially if this is technology aided, comes in, something comes up or the texture changes. I think this is super interesting. I'm really, really excited about it, actually. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting is I think they can, like, put that little dash. Like, the, the bubbles can be slightly different. Yeah, uh, but what this can... reminds me is of Prometheus, when they had the goo. Remember the goo in Prometheus? I didn't uh, see that. Oh, you didn't see Prometheus. I'm like a Prometheus head. But anyway, it reminds me of, like, the goo in Prometheus. Like, it, like the, the surface changes based on what you're doing and all that kind of stuff. Um, what I think this could be really interesting is, like, for gaming or for kids stuff. Yep, they did say they would use it in gaming control devices, remote controls, Yeah, I'm not, I don't think readers. it's going to be for, like, hardcore gamers. Who, yeah. Like, they're not going to be interested in that. Like, you're play, if you're playing like whatever you know shooting game call of duty you, you don't care about this but if you were a kid and you're at disneyland and you walk up to a wall and you all of a sudden you know characters start signage popping. that's my signage idea yeah but i think it, not forget about signage i'm talking about interactive experiences luke to riff on your ideas like imagine we go into like i don't know alice in wonderland area we're, we're, yeah. in, we're like in alice in wonderland but and all of a sudden like you know the Caterpillar comes out, or this person comes out, or the queen comes out, or whatever, and you can touch them, and you move stuff around on them. That could be really like a fun experience. Um, I think this, you know, this stuff is so early on. You know, when you, I was just thinking about other things that I use where I just control with touch. It's like the TiVo remote, right? You know that big button in the middle. You don't have to look down to find that. Imagine yeah. a remote where like this is adaptable to 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 what you need right now. I, I think it's. You know, these things, you know, it's seeing that working this well already just for keyboard. I mean, mm-hmm. imagine three, five years out, you know, where this can be. Why don't keyboards have um, 
just like the F and the J have the little like home keys on them, why don't they have other things on them? Like one of the keys has like the A has the a dot to the top left. The S has a dot, you know, at two o'clock. The D has a dot at five o'clock. The F has the dot at seven o'clock, and the G, you know, so like you basically go around the clock like as you go across. So you could feel. So you just yeah, it's like it just reinforces like right. you're in the right place, and then you the errors would go away. Um, it was really I wonder if they could do it with with temperature too. I don't know if you can sense temperature well enough in your fingers. If yeah, the key heats up a different way, you know. So I think there's a lot. Look, when we talk about you know driving and texting, and and why are the accidents there? Because you have to look at the screen to type and to read. Um, you know, today, you know, take this, you can probably type without looking, uh, you can do it with your voice too, and you can read it back to you. So I think we just have to think about, you know, all the sensors that we're using as, as humans and how can those interact with technology um, in a good way, a positive, like, you know, in a positive, not whatever, but like in a useful way. If you're, if one of your startups, let me ask you this question, if one of your startups is like, hey, I want to work on a product that would leverage like this raising keyboard or Google Glass today. What do you tell them? Um, do it. Uh, we, we actually have people working on Google Glass. But now, if you're working on a, a, an app for Google Glass, you know that you're making something for the Robert Scoble crowd. In other words, a bunch of dopes, there's a like thousand people who have it. Is that, aren't you way too early? How do you know you're like not just way too early and you'll never be able to make any money or have consumer adoption? I think it's you know if you if you just focus on that say we're we're doing something specifically for that yeah that'd be that'd be silly as a startup you never ah. you never have enough runway to do that but if you do something where you can take that technology and say look we're going to spend 10% of our time building something for this ah. or or ex extending what we have on top of this I think it's really fun it's it's the kind of stuff you know it's it's these 20% project that that Google does really well where you you goof around you do some exciting stuff you know it's a time where you know, the Friday late evenings and Saturdays where the employees come in to, to build something. And I think that's, everyone's excited about glass, so let's grow it, let's build something for it. Who cares if we're gonna use it later? It's gonna come somehow, maybe it's like Google Glass, maybe it's gonna be something else. But, you know, starting to think about how we use this in different ways is really interesting. What do, what do you think? Really Luke, interesting. If somebody comes in and they're... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty relevant to work right now because, you know, like, with, with that accelerator that I talked about before, right? That's the same kind of things. People come in and they say, I want to build apps around Nike Plus and the fuel band and all that sort of stuff. Well, that's kind of a, that's a, that's a tough road to go down unless you have sort of some sort of tacit approval uh, for people who are, who are going to build and try to build a, a developer network that's, that's probably more closed. I agree, though. I mean, I, th that's, that needs to happen in those kind of environments uh, for entre entrepreneurs. Uh, you, you don't, you know, I look at thousands of applications. You don't really see people going down kind of one road around super emerging things and aligning themselves with, a, with, with one unique product. They get into something that is broader, like connected health, quantified self, or, um, you know, uh, something that has more uh, of a distributed applicability as opposed to, you know, going down the road with a certain, um, a certain platform. All right, let's do a final story. Jason, let me yeah. let me let me throw something in real quick because this, we actually have one start that is working on something interesting in that space. Just because you, you know, Jason mentioned uh, Fitbit and 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 some of the other things, Google Glass. They're actually building an abstraction layer um, on top of all these wearable devices, so that developers can build on top of them without having to go deep into each one technology. Uh, it's called ah. Human ah. API. Uh, dot co, humanapi.co, huh. and they basically take all these wearable sensors, Fitbit from your phone, the blood pressure, um, the heart rate, abstract it, developers built on top of it, and, and once you start thinking about those things, I mean, you know, we haven't even started with technology when I, when I, when I get going about this. Yeah, it's going to be pretty amazing when, like, your Nike Plus, your Fitbit, your Google Glass, your phone, your watch, everything starts working together. Like, pedometry and all this kind of stuff is going to become really great. Let's do the uh, yeah. Bitcoin story, Mt. Gox story. Mt. Gox. Yeah. All right. So we are fans of Bitcoin around here. At least we talk about it a lot. Yeah, and we were... There's always been speculation that the government's going to get involved, so it looks like it Here finally has. Um, Here we go. So, Department of Homeland Security halted Dwala's Bitcoin transactions to Mt. Gox. Uh, users reporting Mt. Gox couldn't, was not accessible, even. Uh, there is a confirmation from Immigration and Customs Enforcement of a seizure warrant. They say that Mt. Gox may be engaging in money transmitting without a license. Of course they um, are. 
and the Wells Fargo account, Wells Fargo account that Mt. Gox founder uh, created a couple years ago, uh, they say the company does not deal in or exchange currency. So, what do you think is going on here? Are we going to see more of this? Uh, what do you guys think, Luke? Any thoughts? Well, I mean, with these sort of cryptocurrencies, you know, it, it's it's not about the what or how. It's kind of the who, right? And so the, the personalities that seem to be making up some of the use, use cases and the user bases um, within, like, Bitamat and my Bitcoin and some of these other places, they're running into at least some perceived sort of um, shady characters hiding behind, you know, dark yeah. colored glasses, dark colored Google glasses, maybe. Yeah. Um, so it's it, that's just sort of an interesting thing, right? It's not every user's the same, you know. I, I, Bitcoin would be one thing if it if it had one constituency, and it would be something else if it had a different constituency. Yeah. Uh, and perception is reality, especially when you're talking about currencies, right? Yeah, and you know, it's um, so. This is going to be interesting. I think the government has to get involved just because they need to have their thumb on this. I think it's going to continue, but I I kind of think like the United States is not the place like to do this kind of stuff. Kim.com was tweeting about that. Like this might not be the best place to do it in the United States. Thomas, do you have any Bitcoin people in the current class? No, no Bitcoin people. I'm I'm, I'm just, you know, imagine uh, the Swiss realize what's going on and that the entire economy is going to collapse because there's no more money laundering. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, I Bitcoin, I really haven't made up my mind yet. Um, I'm not a fan of regulation, but somehow it also feels like there's things that need to be regulated. Yep. And uh, I, you know, when early on in Google 2002, I was on a team that, you know, tried to accept payments around the world. You know, we got to 40 countries um, pretty quickly and then became incredibly difficult. So between regulations and taxes and all these things, it's nice to have this, you know, abstraction layer. But if that abstraction layer is another currency... Banned? I, know, I think it's going to be banned by the first country in the next 12 months. That's my prediction. First country, can it be, is the question. Can it be banned? Um, well, it can be made illegal. Can it be stopped? Yes. No. Yes. Not, it can't be stopped, but it's going to be made illegal. Hey, this has been a great program. Everybody follow Thomas K. Thomas K. on Twitter. And everybody follow Luke Beatty. I don't know what yours is. Luke, Luke what's your Twitter? underscore Beatty. Luke underscore Beatty. Um, and everybody, uh, of course, check out uh, AngelPad and Techstars, two amazing, great programs. Karen, great job reading the news. The Resumator. And... Mailchimp, thank can you. We, can we just close with that little clip of Larry making fun of Robert Scoble's please, shower picture? Please, please, go ahead. Make fun of Scoble. And uh, thank you, and we'll see you next time. I'm Robert Scoble, one of the first glass holes. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for getting my glass. Robert, uh, Robert I really didn't appreciate the shower picture, though. <laughs> <laughs>